So, um, yes, I, I'm over in California now, and um, I'm sort of the SDR evangelist, software defined radio evangelist at Edis Research. Can I get a show of hands who's actually heard of software defined radio? Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Wow. Just from experimenting with it, or, or do they teach it here at uni now, or what's, what's the deal? I don't think they teach it. I think everyone here is an ACF fan. Okay, cool. Um, so, I would like to this evening tell you a little bit about some of the experiments that I've done and um, hopefully you'll enjoy and, and really appreciate you all coming out. One little anecdote I'd like to add before I go to the depths is I like to go on, on uh, photo ops, especially if I go to interesting locations. And so I thought it would be nice to take a photo by the Adrian and see all these USRP uh, B210s. So I'd actually go on here and um, show we pass them around so you can have a bit of a closer look at what one of these SDRs looks like. I'll tell you a bit about it in a moment. But um, inevitably, whenever I do this sort of thing, even if I'm just minding my own business, I'll come back to that, uh, things <laughs> turn up. So it's either in Italy, the current area, or in San Francisco, the, um, the police there. It's always good fun. I learned my lesson here, the, the pole there, Chopper, when we were doing some experiments, a little kid just rose out of nowhere as we had our big antennas there. And I was holding the camera in my hand, I didn't push the shutter button. So I learned my lesson. Um, but in this case, we would do a bit of an ACL lab Italy, and that's the, that's the crew there. But today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about spectrum monitoring, drones, MPV, restaurant pages, the ISD 3 space probe, a bit of RFID related to that keyless entry into, for example, the photo grids. So if you've heard of um, SDI, can I assume that you kind of have an idea of what, um, what the background is here? This is a, a waterfall plot. It's probably worth explaining that because they yeah. are probably out of on Okay, yeah, sure. Um, who's heard of Gnu Radio, by the way? Yeah, a couple of you. All right, cool. So, if we actually look at this picture, what this picture is showing you is the energy in the radio spectrum across a particular frequency range. So, here we're actually looking at the mobile phone spectrum. And the way this is oriented is that vertically you have time, and then horizontally you have frequency. And then the strength of the pixel at each location gives you the intensity of the energy, RF energy, at that point in the radio spectrum. So what you see is you have these lines that form, which are actually transmissions coming from different cell phone base stations and different towers. So these narrow ones here are from the old 2G GSM towers, and these wider ones are from probably 3G or other more modern um, cell phone comms towers. And you can actually run this in real time and have it fly by, as I'll show you in a minute and actually see what sort of activity there is on the spectrum. So the, you see these little dots here, these are actually traffic bursts that are periodically being sent, probably some conversation to a mobile phone. So now we can think about spectrum monitoring, which is the idea that we can use this technology to actually pull in the radio spectrum to your computer and then do some real-time analysis and see where the activity is and where the usage of the radio spectrum actually is. So you've got that board going around. That one, well, got this one here. Um, so the idea is that with these software-defined radios, you plug them into a computer, that's generally the, the way you do it, and what it lets you do is hook up an antenna on one side and actually give you the raw radio spectrum out the other side. This is in receive mode. If you're running in transmit mode, you're obviously transmitting the raw spectrum digitally from your computer, and then it will actually put it on the air. But fundamentally, it's usually split up into three parts. If we consider the, the front end, you have, a, in this case, a little chip. And this is handling the digital to analog conversion and analog to digital conversion. So remember, on the computer, it's all digital, but in RF, it's all analog. So this is going back and forth, but it also um, has mixes and synthesizers so that you can set the frequency that you want your signal to go out of. In the middle, you have this bigger chip, which is the FPGA. Does everybody know what an FPGA is? Um, what an FPGA is, it's a field programmable gate array, which is basically a fancy way of saying it's a chip there are all sorts of fundamental little building blocks that you can program on the fly. So it's reconfigurable. So I'm sure you've all done you know, courses here where you've had to do the basic combinatorial logic stuff. What is it, DSS? Um, you know, you have the AND gates and the OR gates yeah, and the yeah. shift registers and the latch like This has thousands of them in there. And you can actually write in Verilog, which is a, a very low level language, how to hook them all up. And this thing will run really fast and do what you want to do. But it's not easy to program. 
So this thing handles then some high-speed conversion um, of the raw data that's coming out of the front end. And then finally, this other chip here allows you to hook it up to your computer. So in this case, it's going via USB 3, but you can get it to go via gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet, PCI Express. So that provides the interface. So I'll, I'll show you a couple of things with this in a minute. Um, but fundamentally, that's how, I don't know, how um, the structure of a software defined radio works. So we're looking at the energy on the spectrum here. And with this device, because it's USB 3, you can pull in a huge amount of spectrum, much more than you could even a few years ago. So we're here we're looking at 50 megahertz worth of bandwidth. And if you consider that an FM radio station is 200 kilohertz, you can pull in an awful lot at once of what's going on. So if we actually look at a video of that that I was showing you before, remember those narrow channels there on the right hand side uh, that we saw in the, in the original picture? That's it flying past there. And you can see the traffic bursts as people maybe have conversations and that traffic is broadcast from a cell phone tower. Now what's interesting is you see how every so often there's that sort of line right there? That line is actually a special tone that will tell your mobile phone to um, synchronize its internal oscillator to the cell phone. So your every phone needs to have some sort of reference and in this case, the cell phone tower is actually giving out that reference. So this is a, an interesting little part of the GSM spec where your phone, when it logs on the network, it will eventually try and move its internal clock to align with the base station so that it can communicate properly. Question? Uh, yes, so just a quick question. What is the fastest uh, that modulation occurs nowadays on carrier frequency for communication? Um, I, can I interpret that as what's the sort of largest input <coughs> of data that you can get through a deployed network? Is that well, there are, there are, I mean, the fastest that I read uh, by using like uh, either MP2 frequency or delay communication on a, on a single carrier. Well, it, it depends upon how much bandwidth you have to use. I mean, if you maybe use this guy or use one of the advanced, more advanced users that can do 10 gigabit streaming, you could create a carrier that's 100 megahertz wide and then push an enormous amount of data through there. So it really depends upon the constraints of your hardware. Because you can make your, your carrier or your modulated signal as wide as you possibly want within the constraints of your hardware. So the, the so so it's sort of bandwidth only purely depends on the frequency of the carrier or the frequency range that you're getting? The the bandwidth depends upon how fast you can stream to and from your software defined radio. Right. So you can put I mean the magic thing about this is you can put your carrier anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but it depends upon how quickly you can actually send that data through your interface cable, right? So this one can do 56 megahertz worth of bandwidth. So you, you can make your modulated signal 56 megahertz wide, and then use some advanced scheme to push, you know, hundreds and hundreds of megabits through that if you want to. But, um, okay, so you but you you can read any carrier that goes through here. Yeah. yeah. And but um, like, do, are you fast enough to read any? Do you like have you have enough resolution to read any information going on on any carrier? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the idea. So, your you can think about it, your streaming bandwidth, if it's equal to or in excess of the bandwidth of the signal that you're interested in, yeah. you can read it. Yeah. So and there's that equivalent. There. Right. And so and what's and what's the current maximum that you need? Like the. Well, I mean, it depends on what you want to do, but um, for our most advanced product, it has streaming over 10 gig Ethernet, and you can do 200 megahertz worth of bandwidth. So very wide. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I think you'll maybe get a better idea as, as I go on and show you some more examples. Um, so we were talking about mobile phone base stations, and as a matter of fact, I'm actually running one right here, right now. So if you want to get your mobile phone out and go to manual carrier selection mode, this is assuming, of course, you have an unlocked phone. And you search for a mobile network that does not belong around these parts. It'll be pretty obvious what it is. I've got this uh, terminal open, and if you try logging on, there should be some activity logged here as you do that. Now, when you log on successfully, it should send you a text from 101, <coughs> and it will say, Welcome to the network. And then, if you want to register your own phone number on the network, you can text back at a minimum a four digit number that you want on the network. And then we can have a phone call if you want. You can give me a call. So, um, just to show you what's actually going on here, this mobile phone base station is, is being served 
from this device here, this little board. So this little board is actually what's called a USERP, USRP E310. It's a fully embedded software-defined radio. So it's actually running a dual-core ARM processor, running Linux, and OpenBTS, which is an open source implementation of the GSM um, spec. And then on the top it has the SDR itself. So this entire thing is running an op uh, a fully open source GSM base station, and it's running off this battery pack. So does anybody see this network? It's just a lot. I think someone's logging on. Anybody see it? Yeah. Yeah, I can Yes. Like it takes you my number, like any number. So, so why do you why do you try calling me? This is my my number here. Two one zero. And you can see what there's some activity. I, I, I don't think some people have got the joke yet. The characters. Oh really? <laughs> Chat. Uh, no. Maybe you, you can shout it out. China Mobile. Oh look, someone's calling. Come here. Let's see. What are your overseas call costs? <laughs> Hello, who's that? It's me, I'm right there. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, so now, what I'll show you is, remember how we saw that waterfall? Once you have a range of this, What I'd like to show you then is this, um, this, Mobile phone base stations. So this mobile phone base station is also transmitting a signal, right? Because that's how your mobile phone finds the base station. But like in the waterfall, oh, I missed the call. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Like in the waterfall, there is actually a control channel being broadcast all the time. And that's actually what we see there in the middle of this display. So this program is called HDSDR, and a while back I wrote a bit of blue code so that you could run this with one of these USRPs. And so this is actually pulling in live using this board here, listening to the frequency that the base station is transmitting on. Right? So this is the signal that your mobile phone will hear. And this is that waterfall, so you can see the energy coming out the energy coming out of the base station. Now remember that there's a transmit side and there's a receive side. So this is transmitting from the base station, but your mobile phones will also need to transmit back to the base station. So if we go to the frequency that's used for the uplink, uh, you can see now, so someone's calling me, and this is the, the RF energy that's being transmitted from someone's mobile phone here. So hang on, hang up for a second. I've got two one on this. Someone's, so if you hang up, see how it stopped? Now because there's no activity on the network. So someone tried calling me again. And now there are bursts because the, you know, the, it's doing the, um, the messaging and the, the control messaging back and forth between the phones. But somebody, somebody tried to call me again. 2104. So now it's trying to establish the, a call. There's some activity there. And then it's negotiating. <coughs> what? Anyone call me? I just got a text from you. Oh, so. Now, so now the phone call's happening, and now it's constantly sending the traffic to my phone saying, pick up, pick up, I'm ringing, and if I answer, they go, hello, hello, testing one, two, three. Now remember, this is all digital, right? So you're not going to see my, any hint of my voice because it's digital data going back and forth. But this is actually the real time traffic coming back from the, my, the mobile phones to the base station. And then if we hang up, then it'll say, ending the call, and then it'll stop. So that's really cool because this is a very simple example of monitoring the spectrum. When you look at some frequencies and you can see the sort of activity that's actually going on there. What's, um, the, what's the bandwidth? So here I think uh, we're looking at one megahertz worth of bandwidth. Yeah, it's one. And then one um, GSM channel is, is uh, I think 200 kilohertz approximately. So uh, it's a little bit wider there because we're very close to the transmitters and so we can get a bit of spider across the side. Question, answer. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, normally, OpenBTS requires an SEL of fairly good frequency stability. Yes. Is there any modifications that you've done to the uh, USRP that you're using at the moment? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, the question relates to frequency stability of, of SDRs. And the idea is that when you say, I want this 
software defined radio to tune to this frequency, you tell it to tune to 900 megahertz, say. It's going to fall somewhere close to 900 megahertz. And how close it falls to that specific frequency you want depends upon how good the frequency reference on the board is. So you usually have a crystal oscillator, and depending on how good that crystal oscillator is, that will dictate how well you can tune. And so you can do really advanced things like synchronize it to the GPS constellation, get really accurate. Or if you're just running standalone like this, you might have to actually characterize the crystal and account for some error, which is what we've actually done here. So if there's going to be some error, you can do a bit of you know, tuning, look it up to a spec app, look at how far it is, and then apply some manual offset. So the temperature related to offset or just a straight offset? Uh, well, you can do straight offset. Um, not on this board, because this is actually an earlier prototype, but on the modern boards, um, it has some advanced ways of disciplining it. But, but I won't go into it, but we can talk about it after. Sure. Um, so, oh, some, some more. Some, oh, I've got a text. Someone sent me a text. Wood. <laughs> <laughs> no one, no one sent me text anymore. <laughs> test. Who sent text? <laughs> Someone sent an ad for a rival network. <laughs> Let me try replying to you. So now listen, I'm sending text now, and it's also causing this activity. So it's saying I've got a text, I'm going to send it through. It was a delivered. Oh, I've got another text. So you can see that it's, it's, it's working. Okay. That's, I'll leave that running if you want to have a bit of fun. The final thing I'd like to show you here is this is all digital modulation, right? Let's go for something really simple. Let's go 400. Are you using? So are you multiplexing with your with your So this is this base station's running in full duplex mode, so it's simultaneously receiving and transmitting. Yeah. And GSM itself uses TDMA. So it's time division multiple access. So it divides the yeah. channel into slots. Right. Yeah. Um, so the broadcast control channel, for example, just runs the one that's actually running the broad the system information stuff, but in other slots it also has traffic. And then for the uplink, the uplink channels are divided into slots for each of the handsets. Yeah. So the admin and downlink uh, work on a different frequency. They, they both work simultaneously on a yeah. different frequency. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, that was 945.2 down and 900.2 up. Right. So what I've done here is I've tuned to 400 megahertz. And I've got this little HT handy talkie here. And if I press the button down and start talking, you can see that I'm transmitting FM. So in this case, you're transmitting an analog signal. There's no digital here, it's all analog. And if I don't say anything, you can see here that it's just transmitting a carrier, right? So it's just transmitting a tone. But if I talk, then it's going to modulate using frequency modulation my voice onto the tone. And so as I talk, and the amplitude of changes that of my voice against the microphone, you can see that it's actually. Um, it looks like amplitude modulation for the X axis is frequency. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, can't, I can't run an AM signal right now, but they're, right, they're okay, slightly yeah. different. Yeah, okay. um, so, if I actually unmute um, this, testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. Hello? Oh, no. Hello. Hello. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. One, two, three. So what's happening here is the analog signal's going from the radio, being picked up by this SDR. It's pulling in on megahertz worth of bandwidth, but we said, look at this specific frequency there, and then just a small little bandwidth. And then this software can decode AM, FM, upper side band, lower side band, and these sorts of things. So it's a really neat thing for just doing simple stuff. Yeah. The other stuff is that how much? So. Uh, yeah. So this radio evidently doesn't really put out very noisy. <laughs> Not putting out very good. See the line going here with the warm up side band. Pretty nasty. Pretty nasty. They were starships. There you go. So it's it's another good way. You monitor the spectrum and you can see whether um, people are actually transmitting clean signals or not. Um, somebody's found my other phone number. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that was my thing registering. Oh. Hang on, did somebody send me hi? Yes, I did. Two one oh one. Are you two one oh one? Two what? Two um, two oh four one. Two Yeah yeah, two oh four one. I'm two one oh one. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. You know students, they're pretty smart. <laughs> okay. 
So a any questions there before I move along? Um, the SDR you can't use to run the network. How much would something you can do GSM to broadcast do GSM like that cost? How much would it cost? Um, if you have a so the cool thing about this is that it actually runs the host processor and everything. Yeah, it's, it's embedded. full embedded. Can you can that transmit as well like that? Yes, so this can do full duplex transmit receive, and I'll show you more in a minute, but um, this one costs six seventy five US. Now, um, you know, there are, there are cheaper options all the way down to the $20 ITL bundle, but with these sorts of things, I always say you get what you pay for. So, you said you were using frequency modulation on your base. Yeah. The, the base was using frequency modulation. We've got a base station for the GSM. So, yeah. No, 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 that's not using frequency modulation. That's using, um, for, for GSM, it uses GMSK. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the one we just used to send the text and call for Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all using GMSK, that's, that's part of the GSM, oh, digital right. modulation. Right. There's no analog stuff there. So when you talk on your phone, your phone will convert your analog voice from the microphone into a digital signal, and compressed, yeah. the vocoder, and that digital data is then modulated and sent over the air. Um, and over the air in what format? GMSK. What is that? It's, um, it's Gaussian minimum shifting, it's a special kind of shaped um, frequency shift. Use a Gaussian filter, yeah. and um, it's a way of making it spectrally efficient. So, I mean, so that's, said, that's how it makes like a, like mean intensity that goes up with like a plus and minus a few frequencies. Uh, yeah. And we get those shapes that appearing as we talk. Like the, the the neighboring frequency around the center frequency uh, are getting a. Uh, Intense. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that, I mean, so fundamentally that's, that's frequency shifting, and I'll show you a good example of that in a minute. But this is a more advanced form when you filter it, and it means that you actually end up using slightly less bandwidth, and it's a trade-off between less bandwidth and this thing called inter-symbol interference, right. because each of, those, each of those deviations left and right of your carrier yes. is a symbol, but when you filter it, they end up sort of getting, for lack of a better way of describing it, now, mushed up together, so if you don't have a sort of match yeah. frequency receiver, you can have some errors frequency. Yeah, because with a pure frequency modulator, I would have imagined that it would go to the left. Yeah, right. and, and I'll show you that in a minute. <laughs> so this is actually an example now of um, 100 megahertz worth of bandwidth. So before we were looking at 50, now it's double that. So this is looking at the 400 megahertz bandwidth running in real time. So that you can see all sorts of interesting little signals there going on and off. And then here, if you want to kick it old school, as I like to say, this is ASCII art. Yeah. FFT. So it's actually. 200 megahertz worth of bandwidth, or really 120 megahertz of useful bandwidth. These are all of the FM radio stations there, but in ASCII line. So you can pull in a huge amount. So if you ever want to figure out what car I'm driving, it's the one with all the antennas on the road. <laughs> and this was actually in Vegas at the time, and I had some of these usurps in the back running this frequency um, scan code. So just before I show you this, actually, um, so I can demonstrate this to you now on um, my last So this one here um, is actually, does everyone still use putty? Yes. I, I started using putty when I was um, a student here. So I've actually opened an SSH channel to this cell unit. So these, got, these ones here are actually the same embedded radio, but obviously in a nice case. Um, this one here, I best it's actually to via the network there, but you can also plug in a Wi-Fi USB dongle in the back and turn it into an access point. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this Python code that is going to run the spectrum scan. So it's going to step through these frequencies that you can you can you know uh, program and then say how long you want it to dwell on that for and so on. Um, and in this case, obviously, I don't have a monitor connected to it, but you can connect a monitor if you want via by, by USB. But in this case, it's going to send back the information to my laptop over network. And the windows have appeared here. It's going to show you here. So that one is um, the time domain. And this one is the frequency domain. So remember how before it was just streaming, as we saw on the display? Now it's actually grabbing a bit and then computing the energy and showing you, look into the light. Go on. Uh, showing you what's going on. So again, so we're actually looking at the 900 megahertz Band center on there, which we're using for the base station. So, does somebody want to call again? Oh, see, see that? 
What is it? This is the uplink. So there's up, so somebody's making a call. Or well, somebody's communicating on the network anyway. Is somebody trying to call someone? Someone's sending, sending a text? What are the three different color graphs here? Excellent question. The blue is actually the average energy. The red is the maximum energy, and the green is the minimum. So what happens is you sample a huge, like a significant number of samples, and then you run an FFT on a much smaller window and move it along. And then you average all of those together. So this is, I can't remember how many points this is, it might be a thousand points. Uh, and then it averages it all. So usually you're interested in the blue one, but it's interesting because if you want to tell whether there's um, a signal that's on all the time or is on and off all the time, the first thing you can tell by how the minimum and the maximum also vary. So if you look over here, um, if you look just at the raw signal before you look at it in the frequency domain, does somebody want to um, try calling me again? You'll be able to see this massive change in amplitude. Bit of a step. Yeah, there we go. See that? It was really strong and then it dropped down. And then if we hang up, it'll drop back down again. Because you know this is all noise, but when there's a signal that all needs to go really high. So this thing is completely running on that embedded radio then and just sending the results back over the network. So you can you know put these around the place and have them constantly monitoring the radio spectrum and then reporting back somehow to a central uh, location. So um, lots of cool things you can do there. And, you know, it's not only mobile phones you can look at, you can also look at um, you know TV signals, you can look at um, police radio, which is how I got into it, and uh, <laughs> all sorts of all sorts of interesting things. Well, you know, they're all analog, right? So you get the sort of cops. But then after the Cronulla riots, they went digital. And there's actually an open source project that has implemented the standard that they use. It's called OP25. And that's how I got into software defined radio originally. Um, now it is encrypted, so uh, you can't just listen. But um, there's some very interesting research on the security side of that. So this should be familiar to you now. This is just what the, what the graphs look like. And as you scan, you can see all sorts of different energy signatures there. Um, and the cool thing is, because these things, you can put a GPS module in them too, you can actually log on the map exactly where you have sampled the spectrum. So you have a spatial tag for where you pull in the radio. Yeah. Um, you said you can also scatter them around to monitor transmission. Yeah. Is it possible to get them phase coherent so that you can, say, track the bearing or yeah, fly yeah. it's a little more complicated than that. Phase coherency implies very specific things. Um, but it is possible to do things mode. like time difference and arrival yeah. to get some idea. Yeah. Um, and then with the software, this is all open source by the way. Uh, all of our, you know, the drive for this stuff is open source. The FPGA code is open source. You can get it all off GitHub. Um, and this program is open source too and you can put plugins into it. So if you wanted to have it like tr trigger when there's actually a signal there, you see how all the red dots have appeared? That's in excess of the, the filter mask, the um, spectrum mask, which is in blue. And then you can actually have a log of this hit and tell you, oh, I found a signal of a particular you know, bandwidth at a particular screen. Uh, and then you can actually do them for a whole band, really, really wide um, range of frequencies, and see all the activity that's going on there. So this is all the mobile phone band. And then 2.4 gigahertz ISM, where you've got Bluetooth, Wi Fi, all that sort of stuff that's unlicensed. Um, you can see all the activity there. So this is the board that I was showing you. It's cool because it's USB 3. It's bus powered, so you don't need to be powering so you just plug into your computer. And it can listen from 70 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, which is a very wide range. And what's cool is that you can get an up converter and actually plug that on the front and then listen all the way down to basically DC. So you can listen to all of the really, really low frequencies as well. So signals coming from all around the world. And the, the B210 actually has four RF ports on it so that you can do two transmit and two receive. And you can do interesting applications there, which involve MIMO. So it's multiple in, multiple out. What's the approximate transmit power of this? Um, you can, it depends on what frequency, but um, I think it 50 milliwatts. Yeah. So it's not, not too bad. So let's look at some cool apps then. Um, Who's flown a drone? I know that that's, that's been a subject of some interest here. Yeah. Um, so they have drone meetups, and I went along to one, and that was pretty taken with what I saw there. And uh, they actually do drone racing as well. Make Magazine did a bit of a piece there, and they did drones. They, they did drone racing <laughs> around the park. 
But to actually do the racing, they have video cameras in the front that transmit back down on the drone seats to these goggles that, that the racers do. And the problem is that those goggles in the video stream are actually analog, right? And, you know, we use PAL here, but in America they use NTSC. So this is an NTSC over FM to their goggles. So it uses up a lot of battery. And also, it means that everybody that's racing has to pick their own unique frequency. Because if they get the same frequency, they'll interfere with one another and we'll be able to see where they go. So I thought it would be interesting to maybe try looking at this from a digital perspective. So you know how I showed you the FM versus the GSM, which was digital? I thought, well, what happens if you put a, a video camera on a drone and you transmit down digitally? And because it's digital, you can actually share the spectrum automatically and then you can enable people to use multiple signals without having to manually control them themselves. So I ordered one of these. This is a 3D Robotics X8 Plus drone, and it's um, a bit of a fancy one because it can carry a seat back payload. And the first time I flew it, it was quite exciting. I've never flown anything like this before. And they're really easy to fly when they... I was very excited. And uh, you know, they land themselves, they've got autopilots, they've got a black box, all sorts of sophisticated stuff. But they also have real-time telemetry downlinks. So they give you a little radio modem, and then it'll actually tell you where it is on the map and tell you how high it is and all sorts of other interesting stats in real time. And I thought, well, let's put some payload on it. Let's get one of these radios because it's embedded and runs everything on itself and strap it to the bottom of the drone. And in this case, I've got a little USB dongle plug in there which turns it into a Wi-Fi access point. So I can fly the drone and have my laptop connect to the Wi-Fi access point. And so one of the first things I ran on there was that spectrum scanning code. So instead of being connected by this Ethernet cable, it would just go to the Wi-Fi. And what I wanted to experiment and, and look at was actually whether or not you could see more, or rather hear more, if you had a drone really high up in the air. And so this is um, an example there where you have that average level of the spectrum that flew. This is on the ground, and when I flew it up in the air, it was almost 20 dB higher signal level. So obviously if you're higher up, you can see more transmitters, and then it makes it much more interesting to sort of scan around and see what there is on the spectrum, because it's not obscured and obstructed by you know, the urban environment in question. Did you have a look at how much garbage was coming from the uh, mass amount of powers your uh, copter was using distributing to the brushless motors? You know, I didn't look at it in detail, but I couldn't see anything really obvious in the limited testing. It might be elsewhere, like there might be harmonics that spread elsewhere in the band, but then, again, this is quite high in frequency, so, it, you know, this is an interesting question, let's go ask that, I guess I'll find that if I see some junk there somewhere, but I haven't seen anything on YouTube. Uh, so, back to the, the digital video part of it, I just put a webcam in front of the drone, and this thing's got USB, so I just plugged it in by a USB, and um, it's running there, and it's all hooked up. And instead of using the Wi-Fi now, because Wi-Fi has certain uh, limitations, I used the new radio, which is already on these devices, to create a video link, a digital video in real time, that would send the pictures through to a receiver. So what you're seeing there is uh, the live feed from the webcam, the images are being transmitted digitally, and you can see there on the waterfall those bursts, and each of those bursts in red are a video frame. Remember how I was saying that GMSK is, is a particular modulation technique? And then, you know, it's used by GSM, but in this case I've used G GMSK as well to transmit that because it's, it's a, a nice, simple modulation scheme that has some nice properties. Um, so you can do that. And so in GNU Radio, GNU Radio is a open source software defined radio or digital signal processing framework. It runs on Linux, Mac, Windows. At the base layer, it's written in C++. It has all these blocks that make, can help you do interesting sort of um, processing. Above that, it's all Python, so you can write easily scriptable blue code to plug everything together. And then above all that, you have this graphical environment that you can use that enables you to drop these blocks down, connect them up, and then create what's known as a flow graph. So it's actually showing you how the signal is going to flow through all the processing blocks. And usually on one side or the other, you have a sync or a source, and you can you know, use the use of six, so this is now a transmitter, we have a source of the receiver. So I won't go into the details here, but this one's actually the, the flow graph of the transmitter, and um, this is the flow graph of the receiver. And so it's actually not that complicated, because there's quite a lot of high-level blocks already built into the Radio, so you can get 
going pretty quickly to do some interesting stuff. So you know the the GMSK modulator and D-mod? That's just this one one block there that does it all. I actually ended up using um, a few PSK because you get double the weight. So the first outdoor test will break this. So on the ground I had the laptop with one of these radios as the receiver, and the drone was there with the webcam, transmitting the live data. And remember that with the goggles, it's analog, so there might be interference or whatever. This is digital, so if you get a video frame, it's actually going to be crystal clear. You can either get it or you don't, but if you get it, then it's a perfect video frame. And you can see it decoding live there on, on the right top of the screen. And so I put the drone in the air and I rotate it around. Um, and then eventually, see there's a bit of corruption there, a little bit of corruption in the, the radio link, but then there we are. And so this is a, essentially a live visual video downlink from the drone. And if, if you haven't flown one, it's quite an incredible experience because you can send these things really, really high up in the air. And then, um, I'll show you what that looks like. But, so this is the QPSK downlink coming, you've got your four points on the constellation. And that is then transmitting the raw data to the frame parser, which waits for the video frame to come in, and then it shows you on the display. Um, and then if you look at the waterfall plot, this is what the signal looks like coming down from the drone. Um, and then you can see some interesting stats there. So I said to about 25 meters of the air, and you can see the people's backgrounds. So that, this is sort of the, the rough prototype at the moment. The resolution is not terribly high. Um, but I put my GoPro on the back as well, and so this is maybe the goal, shall we say. Um, you know, you can see really interesting imagery from, from up that high. So that's drawings. Now, I'm sure you've all been to the question. Sorry. Um, no problems. I know the questions are good. I know a lot of people um, want to stick to analog video transmission because they'll say digital systems will be too much latency and fly well. Yeah. Um, I presume with this, the webcam, there is a lot of latency and it's be really difficult to fly with. Yeah, so latency is a really good point. And in fact, in this situation, uh, it's not too bad, and there are certainly ways in which it's going to be tweaked further. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm actually putting the webcam into MJPEG mode, because you know, modern webcams you can add an output, raw frames, bitmap, raw frames. You can do motion JPEG, so it actually does the hardware compression on the camera, and then outputs a compressed JPEG frame. Or you can do some of them have H.264, so it'll actually do temporal compression as well. But that, I presume, takes longer. Yes, yeah, so you get more latency. But you don't really get much of a latency difference between the MJP and the, and the raw frame. So, in this case, it's not too bad because it's MJP and it's just the latency of really being processed through the system and then being transmitted back down. Are we talking less than 100 milliseconds total? Oh, no, it's not, it's not that fast. Ah. Um, but you know, this is just the very first prototype yeah. of working the night before I got on the plane to fly back. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's still a bit of room to work on that. Um, so let's let's move to restaurant pages now. That looks like some frequency shifting there, I think. Um, so you, I'm sure you're all familiar with these devices. You can go and order, and, and the interesting thing is that the rate at which you order in the collection of the food should be about the same, unless everybody gets paged at once. So how do you actually start looking at the system? Well, many of these pages have a frequency on the back. Or you can go online and look at the government's uh, licensing and look what frequencies have been allocated there. Or you can just listen on the radio spectrum with one of these devices and find the frequency that's being used where the page is being sent out. So this is the one that I looked at. And if you look at the signal a bit closely recorded, you can see here that we found the frequency. And it's actually moving between two frequencies. You can see that frequencies along the horizontal, and every time it moves between one and the other, this is actually sending a one or a zero. And what's curious is that it's actually transitioning between these two states very, very frequently. The next step is actually selecting that channel. So we're here I've recorded two megahertz worth, and we just want to zoom in and look at this one little narrow signal there. And then we know that it's frequency shift kings is moving between these two frequencies, but we need to determine the deviation, so how far it's actually deviating off the camera carry it, how far it's moving left and right. And you can just look at that and find that out pretty easily by looking at this frequency plot. Once you do that, you can do FM demodulation, frequency demodulation essentially. And so instead of turning it in the frequency domain into this deviation, you turn it into this time domain deviation here. And this is what you want to see, you want to see a really nice transition between positive and negative one. 
And as you might imagine, this is actually the raw data being sent out over the air. So we know all this stuff, but remember we're coming at a blind. It's called blind signal analysis. You don't know anything about the parameters of their transmitter. So the next step is you have to figure out how quickly they're transmitting that data. Remember the, the old dial-up modem days, how you'd say, oh, I've got a 14.4 modem, oh, no, I've got a blaze, 20 k That's the board rate, right? So here you need to figure out what that is. And you can do this thing called cyclostereotic analysis, where you multiply the signal by a delayed version of itself, and then you do an FFT. And the first largest peak will actually tell you the periodicity of your signal, or the component of the signal. And that tells you your board rate. So now you know how quickly they're sending that data out. And then you can plug it into the Scooter Radio block. One of them, for example, is this clock recovery block. And then it will actually synchronize to the signal. And then it will sample the signal at the precise time when you have a 0 and a 1. And so you have the analog signal coming in, and out of it you have this digital 1 and 0 coming out. So once you take the raw 1s and zeros, you can look at them here, and you see how they change between 1 and 0 very, very frequently. So that means that something else is going on. And this is done because it helps the receiver lock onto the signal. And this is called Manchester encoding. So what Manchester encoding means is that for every pair of ones and zeros here, you actually decode that into one bit. And you can have a zero going to a one, or a one to a zero. And depending on how you do that transition, it really means it's a one or a zero. So if you turn Manchester on, you get half the number of bits which is what we got, and we actually have something that looks like a normal data packet now, some normal amount of data. You've got some zeros, you've got some ones, and then you've got long strings of ones and zeros. Um, at the beginning you have this header, which is usually what you have on a packet, and then if you want to figure out where the data is encoded, so you're paging a particular ID, right? you want to know where that ID is in this packet, you pick two different transmissions and you look for the differences between them, and they're highlighted in green there. So you can see that in this top bit, it's probably going to be the ID, and in the bottom, usually there's some sort of CRC or, or um, hash that's added to the end to, so that the receiver can verify the integrity of the packet. And so if you change something in the payload, it's obviously going to change the CRC at the end, so that's why the end would change there. So once you do that and identify the bits, it's pretty evident then where the ID is stored. <laughs> and the CRC at the end, you can figure out by applying a whole bunch of different CRC algorithms and then figure out which one matches. And in this case, it was just you add a whole of the bytes, multiply 255, and that's your. <laughs> that's quite simple. This happens to be the transmitter for this page system implemented in Python and Video Radio. So you have the thing that makes the packet, you go to an interpolator, frequency modulator, resampler, and then into the usurp. So this thing will transmit the signal now. And this is what the, the thing looks like. You type in the address that you want to page, sends out the signal, and then it might work. Let's see what it, And then if you actually capture it and look at this and compare this to the original signal that we recorded on the air, it actually looks similar. So you think, hmm, maybe there's a chance this might work. Let's see. <laughs> so what you can do beyond that is pretend like it's all working when you go out with your colleagues to lunch, take your laptop, put Wi-Fi into ad hoc networking mode, take your, excuse me, your phone, your smartphone, hook back into your laptop, pretend that you're in the bathroom, bring up a web interface to your pager software, look at your boss's number on his, on his pager, and then page him and make him think that his food's ready. <laughs> so this is Matt Edison, Matt Edison, Matt Edison. And they all think that I just have my laptop there and I'm recording some more data. They don't really know what's going on. <laughs> so there's all sorts of confusion, right? Because he thinks it's ready. The poor lady behind the counter thinks it's ready because this is just how everything works. <laughs> so whenever I turn a little bit, my GoPro he knows that I'm up or something. <laughs> That's why I said that you know. But it also has a slider here. So you can imagine that if you drag the slider from the left to the right, it's going to page everyone. <laughs> I have to say, I 
I've never actually dragged it all the way from left to the right, but somebody else has, and it was pretty incredible to see everyone go. <laughs> Five people died today at a large scram at the front of a fast food restaurant. That's why you've got to be careful because everyone takes the stuff on the And um, another standard is actually the POXAG standard that was used with gold beepers, you know, your pages, so this is in another, another page system. And there's an out of free module for Goon Radio that you can download it, compile it, install it, and it will pull that in. And you can then decode these packets pretty easily. So there's a packet going out, you can see it's logging all the packets that appears on the app and the console. Now, if you look at a frame, I won't go into details, but you can analyze this and figure out where that pager ID is encoded in this one. And then once you figure that out, you can simply create a transmitter. 46, you can see it going up there. And then 46 goes off. And then we'll do 39, and then we'll do 56, and then we'll do 83, and then 82, and 78. What's the board? <laughs> About 56. <laughs> Uh, 2.4 gigahertz version. This page is interesting because what happens is you go to the restaurant, you order at the counter, they give you one of these, you go and sit down at the table, the table has an RFID tag on the other side, this reads the tag and then transmits back to the kitchen where you're sitting so that they will bring the order to you and they know where you're sitting. <laughs> you can use GR, this IEEE 82 15 4 other three module to decode and transmit Zigbee. This is the sort of simple setup. And there it's actually outputting all the Zigbee frames that appears on the air. And you can actually put that into Wireshark and then very simply see where all of the IDs end up, sorry, end up in your data packet. So you have the pager ID and the table that you set down. So you know, this is all on the air, it's all in the clear. So let's now move on to signals coming from outer space. Question? Question? Oh, question? Yeah. Uh, sorry, um, when you have the um, B binary bits from decoding the physical layer, and you try to interpret that. You have this dialogue window where you can choose different sorts of yeah. so Manchester yeah, 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 yeah. and so on and so forth yeah. to calculate the CSA. Yeah. Is that a program you've written or yeah. is it part of the GNU radio? No, I wrote that a while back. Yeah, I can see how that can be quite useful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been meaning to open source those. Was there other questions? No? Okay. So let's now look. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll say so if you have. Um, if you're on a diet or something, getting into um, uh, something to find radio is a bad idea because you end up going to fast food restaurants all the time and playing with it. Yeah. <laughs> and turn off at 3 a.m. in the morning and then getting paranoid when the cops are rushing out. <laughs> the problem is, I didn't realize at the time, uh, I was traveling the next day and I really wanted to get this thing working before I left. Um, and I didn't realize that when they're stacked in the charges, they actually don't listen. They're only listening when they're off the charging stack. Mm -hmm. So I tried to them all off and they weren't going off, and that's why. So let's now turn our attention to the heavens. We've been considering terrestrial signals so far. Um, this is an interesting project that I just happened to get involved in. There was an old NASA space probe called ISE 3, and it was launched in 1978. And it went out eventually into a heliocentric orbit, but it was designed to study the interaction between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. Now consider that this is 1978. So this doesn't even have a computer on board. It's just really primitive electronics, shift registers, sequences, really simple stuff. And it was later renamed to ICE, and it was the first spacecraft for quite a few things. In particular, it was the first probe to be put into the L1 Lagrange point, which is a special point between the Earth and the Sun, where the gravity sort of cancel, in a, in a way of putting it. And then as the Earth rotates around the Sun, it sort of gets gently dragged along with it. So this was the first experiment for NASA doing this. In addition, it was the first spacecraft to pass through the tail of a comet. Many other nations had probes going up to visit uh, Halley, but the US wanted to beat everybody, so they repurposed this to go and do the flyby so they could claim to be the first. So somebody at NASA had this amazing ability to design these incredibly complex orbits and trajectories. And this is sort of a visualization of it going out to first the L1 point and then doing lunar flybys to pick up the speed and then go out into a place and orbit fly past this comet on a particular date he was able to design it down to the day. So if you look at the original trajectory of the probe, 
you imagine that the sun is all the way out to the left, and the moon is orbiting that white circle there, and the earth is at, at the center there. So we're looking at as the Earth rotates around. So it goes up to the L1 point here, and they do some orbits there. They come back and do some sort of crazy maneuvers there to get up to speed, and then do it with the lunar flyby, and then it, it gets flung back out into the, into the orbit. So mind bending stuff, incredible. The probe itself is spin stabilized, it's actually spinning all the time, and it has uh, S band um, radio system on board that runs about 2 gigahertz, and a whole bunch of thrusters so they can be maneuvered around. This is an example of one of the old telemetry screens that NASA used to actually look at the state of the space probe in real time. So, stuff about the propulsion system, stuff about the electronics information, about all sorts of different subsystems. And eventually, the funding ran out, and the mission's due to a close, and they put the probe into a graveyard orbit, just orbiting around the sun. And eventually, in 2014, it starts flying back toward the Earth, catching up with the Earth, and it's going to do the lunar flyby. And some hands in Germany managed to pick up the signal in 2008 and discovered that actually the space probe was still alive. The batteries have long since died, but it's covered in solar panels that were still generating enough power to run the thing. And they actually picked up the carrier signal coming down from the transponder. It wasn't transmitting any information, but they found the carrier. So you can visualize the orbit like this, quite pretty. Uh, but this reboot mission got together in California, they raised a bunch of money using crowdsourcing, and they thought, well, let's try and get in contact with the space probe. Let's see if we can talk to it again. Let's see if we can determine what state it's in, the health of the, of the space probe. And then, if there's fuel on board, so we can fire the thrusters and bring it back into orbit around the Earth. And there's a whole bunch of science instruments on there. And so if we can turn the science instruments back on, then we can open it up to public science. Pretty cool idea. But the problem is, you have the space probe hurtling it 4.2 kilometers a second toward the Earth. And you need to figure out how to buy the thrusters and bring it back into orbit. Now there's apparently, where we're hoping, fuel on board, but there's only a limited amount of fuel, and the closer you get, the more fuel you need to burn, the higher your delta V it's called, to make that trajectory correction maneuver. And so if you look at that as a graph, eventually you end up exceeding your 100% of fuel and you can't make the maneuver anymore. So the longer we would wait, the more fuel we'd have to burn. So we wanted to try and get everything done. In good, good time. So, how do you get in contact with a space probe that's 15.5 million kilometers away? You go to the largest radio telescope on the planet, and this is Arecibo, the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. You might recognize it from such films as 007, 007 Goldeneye, and Contact. That's right. So, it's absolutely massive. It's 1,300 meters in diameter. Wait, have you been there? Yes. These are my photos. Oh. <laughs> so we went out there, three of us went out there to talk to this old space probe because NASA had actually gotten rid of the old equipment, the modems essentially they used to talk to the space probe. So there was no way to talk to it anymore. So the reason that I got involved and, and my former colleague and friend got involved is because we ended up using this technology to recreate the old NASA modems to talk to the space probe. So we basically took a laptop, a couple of laptops, a couple of these SDRs to Arecibo hooked it up to their gear, recreated the modems in Google Radio, like the display grass that I showed you before, and sent commands to the probes to turn it back on. So, um, it's a huge structure, really amazing. The entire platform there is suspended on these three towers, and there's some steering ability. So this is the dome that actually contains multiple stories of receivers and transmitters, and this thing can move along the azimuth arm, and the entire platform can rotate. So you can track an object as the Earth rotates as well. Um, for a limited amount of time. And we can see the probe for about 2 hours and 45 minutes each day. So if you're actually on the platform, looking down, this is the view, and then we would walk down um, the platform, down some ladders and staircase and things like that to get into the dome. And uh, we had a custom-built amplifier shipped from Germany, international FedEx overnight, installed in the dome so that we could use that particular frequency because they couldn't hit that particular frequency that we needed. So this is their patch panel in the control center. And we had a laptop and the software defined radios, and we just hooked it up there and, and um, were able to receive the transmitting signal. So, initially, the, the dish wasn't pointing directly at the space probe, so we didn't know exactly where it was. So, the signal we got was very, very weak. Um, and you can see it there. Can anybody tell me why this line is diagonal? Because remember, this is a, a single frequency that's coming down from the space probe. Double shift. Double shift. Very good. Why? Why go double shift? Because it's not hitting the Earth, it's going to go past it. 
Well, we're going to think things will, will move, and that will give you the Doppler shift. So, what are the components that are moving in the system? The craft and the Earth. The spacecraft is heading toward the Earth, and the Earth is rotating because the dish is actually in the Earth. So that's why you get the Doppler shift. Um, now, once we actually figured out that we did a manual search in the sky to pinpoint exactly where the probe was, we got a really nice strong signal, which is what you would expect from such a big concrete dish. So, is there, is there an acceleration going on? Is there an acceleration going on of the spaceship? or an acceleration? No, acceleration. Oh, acceleration. Yeah. Like yes, yes. Yeah. Because it's being pulled in. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. The orbit's designed so that it, it flies by the moon. Yeah. It picks up some energy. So this was not as much of in time, uh, the signal, uh, like the, drop, the, drop, the, pure, the previous one. This one? Yeah. Oh, this is only got like over a couple of minutes. Before. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so here, we actually then got around to transmitting commands to the probe to wake it back up and turn the telemetry on so that we could see what, what its health was, what the state of the probe was. And this was a little bit interesting because um, my colleagues had done all this whole NASA documentation. And this is all, you know, kosher. We had signed the Space Act Agreement with NASA and they were fully aware of what was going on. This was supposed to be sort of setting a precedent for citizen science, citizen space science. There was a lot of documentation, there was a lot of conflicting information in there about how to talk to space. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to take that into account in software so that we could try all these things, all these different permutations, but really quickly because we only had a very limited amount of time out of our SIBO to try this stuff out. So as we were sending stuff out, I also wanted to verify that the signal was actually going out into the air so that the entire system was working. And so again, I got one of these radios, and I'm just holding it there with the antenna, tuned to the frequency that we're transmitting up at, making sure that some of the energy that's coming out of the dish will obviously spill over the side, but that the energy is actually coming out of the transmit. So you can see there, like with the, you know, as we saw before, live, this is the, the command going out of the space probe. So it's a good way of verifying the system is working. Um, on the, sorry, on the monitor on the right there, is that a video feed of the glistron to make sure it's not catching fire? That's exactly right. <laughs> so they actually have, they have two uh, one megawatt glistrons that they use. Megawatt? For. Yeah. They use for an S band radar work. So we weren't using that because it couldn't oh. do the frequency we wanted, which yeah. is why we got that custom apple line. But they use that to do imaging of asteroids and all sorts of amazing things. Um, and if you calculate the output of that with the. Um, the dish gain, which is I think 73 to 75 dB of gain, you get, was it 20 terawatts of power going up? <laughs> Effective radiated ice from radio power. So it's huge. <laughs> Doesn't stand in the way. Yeah, actually birds would fly in and they get cooked and catch fire and fall down. <laughs> <laughs> it, would be, it would be really bad. So this is what happens eventually. <laughs> My, my friend Austin, <laughs> and this was the moment where we had sent the command that had been successfully uh, received by the space probe, and that lonely carrier that was unmodulated suddenly became modulated into telemetry. So we can finally start recording that and attempting to decode it. There are two transponders on the probe, so we were looking and recording both of them there in real time, as you can see. And then the next step was to decode it. So um, one way. I went about doing initially because we have such a strong signal is just using the new radio you can see here, looking at the carrier, you can lock onto the carrier and then do carrier tracking and then do demodulation. I won't go into the details, but um, it was nice to use the basic building blocks of the new radio to get that working. And then um, that would spit up the raw data, right? But you need to make sense of that raw data as per the NASA specification. So I wrote this Python program that would process it all per the spec and then actually print out and show you the status of all the subsystems on the probe. So here we're looking at things like the, um, the current consumption, the voltage, the spin rate of the space probe, um, the angle to the sun, the settings on both of the redundant hydrazine propulsion systems. And, um, and what we would then do later on is we would send the commands out to fire the thrusters and make sure that all the settings were correct as we would have expected. And then if it's all good, then we would send the commands and go. So we had a, a flight director and we had you know, flight ops laid out for each day. It was, it was pretty cool. Uh, but let's actually now listen to the telemetry. So you can run the telemetry at different rates depending on how far away the space probe is. And this one is running at 16 bits per second. So you can actually hear the individual tones there. Right? So this is really, really slow. And then you can go a bit faster at 64. And you'll hear it come up out of the noise. Okay. 
that's when the deer shows is up actually tracking in and looking at the probe. And then the one that we used more often than not was 512. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn out my hand every time a new frame of data begins. So you can hopefully hear the pattern in the audio. Can you hear that? There's a little repeating. And what's happening here is this is demodulating that. And this here, this sync, actually happens at every time, at the beginning of every new frame. So there's a filter there that looks for specific sequences that are fixed in the, in the end of the frame when that signals the beginning of a new one. So you can see here that as the data comes in, it starts building up these frames, these subcoms as they're called, and the raw data out of this is actually used to populate the intelligible information that you know, is, is passed at the end. So here we're looking at um, the command count of the spacecraft clock, the um, signal strength of the space probe is from our transition from Earth. Uh, and this is all coming back down in real time. You and said, then, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you say you're doing different speeds though. Do you like send configuration data to the crowd? That's right, yeah. So you send a command and you say turn transponder A on this particular rate, transponder B to that particular rate. Yeah. Um, and then consider also, because this is such an old probe, doesn't have any concept of consistent storage. You can't say, right, this science instrument is going to log all the data so, you know, flash or whatever. All the data has to come down from the program in real time and be received. It can't be stored up there and sent down later like they do in more modern programs. So everything's got to come down in real time, which is why when it was closer, you may be used to the 2K rate, which is this one. You can hear it's something more like a modern motor because the data rate is so high. And then if we eventually look through all the stages of the decoding process, this is really using all of the techniques that I've told you about already with the pages and all that sort of stuff. We're using the same concept. Um, there's the clock recovery before we saw the cyclostation analysis to determine the data rate. So here we're looking at the sync. And every time the sync happens, you can see there's this big peak in the filter response. And then you can see there's this big sequence that stays there in the middle. Nothing changes. But then the frame on the left, the preceding frame from the the next frame will take the data. You can see there it's actually updating hell a lot quicker now because the data rate is much faster. Beautiful. Um, and so what we did then is, I, on top of that, I wrote this little Python code to graph stuff in real time. So when we tried to fire the thrusters, there's an accelerometer on the space probe. And every time you fire a thruster, you expect to see an impulse registered on the accelerometer. And that would confirm a successful firing. And we did the very first firing, which is just to spin the space probe back up because it had slowed in its rotation a little bit. And that worked, and so we were really happy. And then after that, we went to fire the other thrusters to bring it back into orbit around the Earth. But unfortunately, every time you're trying to fire the thruster, you can see on the accelerometer here, in the short term and over the long term, it basically would flatline. You get a, sometimes a little bit of a response, but nothing nearly as significant as what we'd hoped for. So consider that NASA had logged fuel consumption, that and it would indicate that there's still plenty of fuel on board. And from our measurements uh, of the temperature variation when we would turn the tank heaters on and off, consider that if there's fuel in there, the thermal mass will be different. And so the rate at which it heats up and, and cools down will indicate how much stuff there might be inside. And so my colleagues did a bit of analysis of that, and it would also suggest that there was fuel on board. So why didn't we get any thrust out? Every time we tried to get it, you would basically have nothing. It was a big, big disappointment. And if you look at the propulsion system, you've got two redundant sets of tanks, um, two valves, redundant sets of thrusters, lots of really you know, clever redundancy built in here. The problem is, to force the fuel out of the tanks, there's pressurized nitrogen inside. It's the pressure to push the hydrogen out, down into the rest of the system, in, through the valves, into the lines. And so the theory is that over the 30 years, there might have been an incredibly small and slow leak and that nitrogen is this gas on the pressure and it's just leaked out. So unfortunately, we couldn't find the thrusters. And as a result, it's gone back into orbit around the sun like it's been doing in the preceding years. Now, we did manage to turn some of the science instruments back on. So we got a little bit of science data, and that was pretty cool. Um, and one little interesting story I had was, are you familiar with the DEF CON conference in Vegas? The security conference? I had to reboot one of the science experiments on the probe. And I was sitting in down in the front row in one of the theaters watching some of the presentations. I didn't want to get up to leave because 
I stood in line for a while to claim my spot, but I needed to reboot the thing. And you don't get on the Wi-Fi there because then immediately everybody starts hacking your laptop. <laughs> so I sussed out the guy next to me, and he seemed alright. He was from Norway, and he seemed like like a good bloke. And I didn't have any mobile phone reception because I picked the wrong carrier to go with, so I couldn't tether to my phone. And he was nice enough to let me tether to his phone. So I ended up rebooting this um, size experiment on this space probe that had flown by the moon while tethering to this guy's phone while watching a presentation during DEF CON. I was praying and hoping that he wasn't actually you know, doing something with my, with my signal with some sort of hack mobile phone that he might have offered me. But he, he seemed pretty legit. Um, so that was, that was interesting. So, um, I was, okay, so I was like to sit next to, next to that guy. Um, but Google Creative Labs was nice enough to actually follow us around on this mission. They put together a little website and did some video documentary and stuff. So if you're interested in looking at that, they have some very pretty visualizations of the orbit that it went through. Um, and you can go there and watch the video. This was also supposed to show the live data because we hoped to run the probe for longer. Um, but obviously it didn't happen before you even started all this. It's now in a mode where it doesn't even... It went into safe mode, so it rebooted itself. So when it was coming toward the Earth, it was transmitting to the carrier. But now it's rebooted itself, and when it comes up, it's not transmitting anything, it's only receiving. And this was because it was eclipsed by Planet or Moon? I don't think it was eclipsed, it's just that it, it, when it did the flyback, it sort of drifted slightly up out of the orbit, and then it might have been in some, some angle or attitude or something, and basically the sunlight falling out wasn't enough. When we turned all the science instruments, not all of them, quite a few back on again, so the current consumption would have been more. And unfortunately, maybe just the combination of events meant that it was just, there were just too many things turned on. You're a fast building. <laughs> Sorry if I'm dragging this out longer. You mentioned that there isn't a really any permanent storage on the craft. I presume there'd be a little bit, at least for some stuff, or is it completely passive? It's com <laughs> completely real time now. I mean, there's another system, and that there's I can't remember the acronym now, but you could actually create a manual configuration for the telemetry. Um, that would be stored, I think, in core memory. I was going to ask what but it was. It's only a tiny, limited amount to actually configure how the telemetry would be sent out in some custom mode. But in terms of actually storing any data or any, any stuff like that, it's all directly straight down. So even the original route would have been hard coded into it. So what? The original route it took. I presume it had to fire thrusters in. Well, no, but that was all commanded from ah, the other in okay. real time, just like we were doing. Would they have used the same Arecibo? Um, no, they would have used the NASA Deep Space Network. Which is what you know they have um, a few sites around the world, and that's what they still use apparently to talk to all the different probes. There's a question for you. Um, I was curious. Uh, did you manage to get it to spin successfully? Yes, yeah, so the spin up worked. And the reason why that worked, I think, is because there was still residual pressure in the line. So the valves, you know, have it locked off, and it had still been pressurized in there, and that's the fuel that we ended up pushing out on the catalyst bay here and having it, you know. Um, Actually provide that for us. Yeah. So when we try to get it from the tank for the subsequent firing, we were. Would that speed change its orbit at all? Or is it no, no, because it, it, it's um, essentially just providing it some yeah. additional mo uh, moments of spin it up to that nominal weight because it just slowed down a little bit. Yeah, geez, nitrogen is really a bump down. Can't you find them in space? <laughs> <laughs> it was very annoying. Uh, so that's the team and um, Mission HQ, Mission Headquarters, Mission Control was actually based in an old McDonald's. <laughs> we call the McMoons on the um, Air Force Base in, in Silicon Valley at Moffitt Field Air Force Base. You're still playing with pages, even when working with satellites, you can't get over it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll, um, I'll just skim through this stuff just to give you a bit of flavour. Um, a 747 has lots of different radios on board, and that makes someone like me really happy. <laughs> Probably I heard some people talking here about ADSB. ADSB is uh, uh, the secondary radar system where the transponder on the aircraft actively transmits things like position, heading, altitude, and so you can receive those signals. Um, they happen very, very quickly, so you need an SDR because it's a high bandwidth signal. Um, but once you do that, you create a demodulator for and a decoder of your radio. You can see here the data frames coming down from all of the different planes at different distances, and so you have different amplitudes. And then you can take that, decode it, and then provide this interesting sort of visualization of airspace in your local area. So this is the Bay Area, and you have their planes coming and landing in SFO, San Jose, Oakland. 
and um, you can produce these interesting trails. So you can see the sort of flight paths and that color coded altitude there. Um, and then you, because you have altitude, you can also do stuff in 3D. This is a system I wrote way back um, to actually visualize all that in Google Earth in your web browser. I had a set up uh, here for Sydney before I left, uh, but that's unfortunately no longer working. Um, and because you can do that in 3D, you can also do this virtual cockpit view, so it's as if you're flying a plane, <laughs> and then you can get a sense of what it's like taking off and landing, um, as if you're sitting in the pilot seat. And so as you swing around the plane a little bit, you can see the bay, and you end up tracking north, and you can see there uh, San Francisco. Water shifting. Uh, and then back here in Sydney, when I was originally running it, you have all the flight paths, but there's another radio system that aircraft use called ACARS, which is the Aircraft Communication and Reporting System. And that sends stuff like performance reports from the Rolls-Royce engines back to Rolls-Royce, uh, waypoints for the planes, yeah, the yeah, control the yeah. <laughs> And every time that happens, it actually logs it spatially on the flight path and then provides the information to the balloon. And then when it detects flight path information with waypoints, it'll actually plot those waypoints out so you can see the flight path that's going to be taken on that plane. Now that's the secondary system. The primary system is when you have this really big radar dish that spins in the airport. It sends a signal out and waits for that signal to reflect off, in this case, metallic bodies of the aircraft. And you can see here, when it sends out the big pulse, this is the big pulse here, and you can see some reflections happening here. So this is actually energy that's bouncing back off stuff. And this really caught my eye. So, um, if you look at it in the time domain, you have the big bang going out from the radar, and then it listens for a while, and you have these echoes coming back. And you can see here, you have the bang going out, and then these echoes coming back. Now, if you actually plot that, on a, if you, I wrote a bit of software to do the analysis and synchronization. So the bang is here, and you get these interesting returns coming back. If you turn that into a raster plot, each scan line is triggered by a pulse from the radar, and then it listens for a certain amount of time. And then every subsequent scan line going vertically is going forward in time. So it's basically looking at all of the returns coming back from the radar. And remember, this thing, I've just gone out to the hill near the radar, and I'm using this to receive the return. I'm not using a big fancy antenna, I'm just using this and a little wood antenna. Yet, you can pick up all these interesting features that come back. You can see here, you've got these interesting lines and this dot out there and this is all clutter that's really close to the radar but you've got some interesting stuff further out. So if, if you wrapped that around into uh, a polar shape that would actually sort of be like a 3D scan. Like that. Like that! Perfect! <laughs> so this is actually now sent on the radar and those curved lines actually become straight when you do the polar unwrapping and these turn out to be the power lines that are actually crossing the water there. So they're reflecting the radar energy. And then you have the bridges further out that are reflecting the radar energy. And large sort of structures and buildings around the bay there that are doing that as well. Now, if you record multiple revolutions of that radar, you take the first one, you take the middle one, and you take the last one, and you map them into the red, green, and blue channel of a color image, you get this. And so anything that stays the same, anything that stays in the same position, through each of those rotations will overlap and you'll get white. So you know that white is static. Anything that moves, you will have this RGB triplet, which you can see in this picture. So something is actually moving there. And you zoom that, you can see this, this return there. Now if you unwrap that, it ends up up there. And I don't know exactly what it was, sorry, uh, but I would assume maybe depending on the speed and so on, it might have been a big truck facing me. And because the side of the truck is a nice large radar cross-section, it will end up reflecting quite a bit of RF energy back at my radio. So that's just my theory, I don't know for sure. But there was something that was moving uh, on the road. So, last thing I'd like to talk about is RFID. Question? Did, did, did the cabin crew, uh, the hostess, like, did the guys uh, look at you or what they're Oh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I was driving around San Francisco and I saw all these street poles these yard antennas pointing down onto the lanes. And I thought, well, what's going on here? What could they possibly be looking at? So I got my radio <laughs> and then recorded the signals. And then I did a little bit of analysis and it turned out to be fast track. So here there's E pass, right? E tag. E tag. So there it's called fast track. And this was me being incredibly inconspicuous at the toddlers of the Golden Gate Bridge with my antenna also pointing there to see whether the signal is the same. So, fast track is interesting because it uses this thing called backscatter modulation. And the actual 
signal that's sent by the reader uses pulse position modulation, which is the same thing as mode S for the aircraft. So you can see that there are all these similar sorts of things that tie into these different systems. And backscatter modulation is really interesting because the tank has a long life lithium battery in it, but it never actually transmits actively back to the reader. The reader sends down a signal and it provides this backscatter carrier. And the antenna in the reader has its load changed. Its radar cross section is changed and modulated with the data that it wants to send back to the reader. So the reader actually simultaneously sends and receives the signal. And it looks how the return energy is being modulated by this antenna that's electronically being changed in the tag. Really clever setup. So if you look at the signal, you've got the wake up, which will wake up the tag. And then you have the preamble, you have the payload, and this is the reader saying, hey tag, give me your ID. And then it provides this backscatter carrier. Remember, this is all in my field as well. So you can use this thing called RF circulator. Basically means that you can transmit <laughs> and receive from the same antenna. And in this setup, we've just got the tag there. And what happens is you run that. This is a good radio program again. You've got the carrier there. When I hold the tag up, then suddenly it gets modulated with the data coming back from the tag. And then voila, you see my fast track ID. And again, this is uh, the decoder there. Filter looking for the, the response coming back to the tag. A little video demo, we've got the tag behind the, uh, the windshield there. Hold it up and it just reads it. So you can stand on a bridge with a powerful reader and just read everyone's tag that's driving on the way. Which is what they're doing with those Yagis pointed out in the lane. So they can effectively track everybody with the, with the past that's driving along that road. And your tag won't be. Uh, and this is a blog graph for that. Yeah. That, that's, um, that's, a more, that's a more simple one. But this is the fast track is quite as well. just that one. And then you can also look at uh, key fobs, security of buildings, and interestingly, it also uses backscatter. So you have the reader, it energizes the tag, the chip internally does some cryptographic computation, and then modulates via backscatter that um, cryptographic response back to the reader. And you can zoom in and you can see exactly what's going on there for an analysis and all. So finally, Keyless entry. Well, your mind has um, the previous. I wanted to see how this actually worked. So the way it actually works is that the car is constantly sending out a low frequency broadcast, and if you get nearby with a remote control, it has a three-axis low frequency pickup. And when it hears the signal from the car, it wakes it up, and then the car, sorry, the remote then replies back to the car saying, "I'm here." The car will then send a cryptographic challenge to the remote. The remote does some computation, and then sends back over UHF the cryptographic response. And if it all matches up, the car unlocks itself. Now, the UHF response is the same kind of response, I mean, the same frequency as if you would press the key on the remote, if you actually use a normal remote control. So here I actually have this, this other radio, and this is simultaneously listening to the low frequency and the UHF frequency. And that way you can record both and see how they work uh, from the same standpoint in time. And so if you look at signals, this is the LF that's being transmitted from the car. It sends the wake up, and then it sends the ID to the remote, and then it sends the challenge to the remote. The remote itself coming back sends an ACK, and then another ACK, and then finally the cryptographic response. And this happens all very quickly. Now, if you receive both at the same time, and you can plot them in the same uh, frequency plot, you can actually see how it all lines up in time. So if we run a little video there, you can see it's periodically sending out these um, uh, wake ups. And then eventually there's a response from the remote. But what I wanted to do is I want to try and get in the middle of this. So very quickly, this is the wake up and then the challenge um, to the remote. But here, we've got this coil that's going into the up converter into the SDR. This is listening constantly from what, from what the car's sending out. And then you've got this, this one here that's ready to transmit UHF back to the car. Inside, I have this radio that's actually now listening and now it's going to transmit out of this coil what the car is transmitting. So I'm basically recreating the car inside. And then also uh, I have this other radio here that's ready to receive what the remote control will actually send out. So what you can do is you can put the remote control on the coil and then it will think that it's near the car. And so what happened was that signal coming from the car was rebroadcast inside. The remote picked it up. It realized it was being woken up and then sent an ACK out. And so the wake up is there. It's coming inside. This is what's coming in from the car. And then here is what is coming back from the remote. You can see there was a response triggered there. 
And you know, so far that's a, that's a good step. It's exciting. This is what's being rebroadcast outside. This is the outside computer of the VNC. So that initial relay part of the system is working. And of course, I had a feeling this wouldn't work for a very good reason, and I hoped it wouldn't work in some way. But I was so excited to stuff it all, let it run, and see if something interesting happens. So I was just doing that there and run outside. And the Prius there all set up, so this relay's going. So this is happening over Wi Fi. Wi Fi is the link between the radios inside and outside. And so I pulled the handle, and of course it was still locked. And I, and I had a feeling it would be. Um, and in a way, you'd hope it would be because then that would be a major security flaw, right? So, can anybody hazard a guess as to why this did not work? I know what. Hey, hang on. You probably know. So you, oh, you, anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's a bit of a guru. Any, any, other, any other ideas? Any guesses? Yeah. My guess is the response, like the cryptographic response. You couldn't send the right one. Well, remember. I'm not recruiting the cryptographic response, I'm just relaying what's happening between the car and the remote, but I'm separating them. In, and I'm separating them by this RF link. So I'm just relaying what one sends to the other and back and forth. So the cryptographic response should be correct from the remote. Uh, either probably too powerful transmission, maybe? Or you said something about ISM band, was it the same as the Wi Fi you're using? Um, no, this is um, LF, so it's like 137 kilohertz in one way, and then the other way it's 300 something megahertz the other way. But the power wasn't a problem. That was all fine. Any other guesses? It's because when you put it through the Wi-Fi and you uh, convert it into audio and does it back the other way, it uh, sort of um, lost some bits in between. Um, no, the fidelity is actually completely intact. Too slow. That's it, that's exactly right. <laughs> so the problem is timing, and this is a problem that creeps up in software defined radio all the time. It's something you really have to be aware of. Latency. Late this is what you're gonna say, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The latency of your system can really affect the performance. So you've got really really high performance, really quick turnaround, really high data rates, so you have really low latency. And when you go through a radio to a computer, so over a Wi-Fi link to another computer and then to another radio and then back around from the radio in the reverse, it ends up being a little bit slow. And that's a good thing because if you actually look at it, these are the two signals when that transaction happens. And if you look at it in the time domain, you can see that the gaps in between the transmission from one to the response from the other is actually really, really small. And so to get this sort of latency through this big system, I couldn't do it with that kind of system where you have all, all sorts of complaints happening. But, um, it is theoretically possible if you go directly from one radio over a hard line to the other one. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting thing about the future of SDR. This FPGA in the middle, it's hard to program, but we're working on a really interesting effort to make it easier to do, make it more accessible, to the point where, remember in GNU radio, you can drop the blocks down? You can actually drop blocks down, and it will actually configure them up and do that computational offloading in the FPGA. So let's say I want to do an FFT. Instead of having to take the data from the radio to the computer and you do the FFT on the computer, you drop this special RF knock, it's called network on chip, RF network on chip block, into GNU radio. And it will actually tell this FPGA to take the data coming out of the radio and do the FFT immediately on the device and then send the result back to the computer. So that way you have extremely low latency because you're doing it all on the radio board before you send anything over the interface back to the computer. So, that's extremely powerful, and really that's how you get down to the lower latency. Um, so, one final little thing, I've started this software-defined radio meetup in the Bay Area, and we've done it five times, and we do it monthly and alternate between the South Bay and San Francisco. People come and talk about interesting software-defined radio projects they're working on. I'd really love to see um, a chapter open up in Australia, whether it be Sydney or whatever, so, um, you know, if you, if you consider that Maybe you can get together some interesting um, presenters and get a bit of a group going. It would be really nice to see. So I'm just sort of plant that little seed there. But uh, yeah, that brings me to the end. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. So any, any questions before we wrap up? Question over there. Um, after you're involved in the ISE 3 um, satellite thing, are there any other satellites that are out there that have kind of been forgotten about that could be woken up? Yeah, potentially. I um, didn't really follow up too much. I think there was one in particular that I can't remember what it was. 
Uh, and you know, it's, it's it's a little bit difficult. This one has a lot of a lot of um, conditions around it that were sort of just right for us to move ahead with it. Um, it's not often the case for other space probes, depending on upon you know, who launched them, what the payload is, where it is, um, what set it's in, and so on. So we were pretty lucky with that. Question. Uh, have you had any experience playing with ultra wideband signals? Ultra wideband, I haven't played with them myself, but uh, I do know that there are people that are using our hardware to do experiments with that. Um, would it be possible to run like multiple, like, multiple services of one of those SDR, like say Wi Fi, 4G, 3D, like all in the one room or something like that? Yeah, yeah, so that, that's an interesting point. Because you can actually get especially the higher band of SDRs to transmit a very wide band bit of spectrum, it doesn't necessarily mean that you only put one signal out on your spectrum that you're transmitting. You can completely independently put all sorts of different separate signals out there, but as long as you combine it into the one bit of radio spectrum and send that out, your radio will faithfully output the entire thing. So, you know, if you, you can uh, potentially transmit a wide band signal and, and then like have eight different GSM stations running simultaneously. Or you know you could transmit ten different FM radio stations. Or as you said, you could have an FM radio station, a GSM station, and like an LTE station or whatever. There was a guy in France that actually wrote completely on his own a uh, full implementation of the 4G LTE stack EnoB base station that runs on uh, hardware, just out of the blue, turned up one day. Here you go. He's also the guy that wrote, wrote and started FFMP, QEMU, and broke the record for calculating well, digits of pi on a desktop. <laughs> <laughs> so his, his, his guy is called Fabrice Villard. He's amazing. He just did it one weekend. He probably did. <laughs> um, and he's commercialized it, and, and it's, it's a really cool piece of kit and a good example of what you can do with this stuff. So, so, yeah. What are you guys planning on doing with, the, uh, with this, like, product that you're making? The embedded one? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's got interesting applications that you can scatter around and try and figure out where a particular signal is coming from, because it will take a slightly different amount of time to reach each antenna. And so if you can have them all communicate together, you can figure out where that signal is coming from. Um, I would like to still pursue this digital video downlink and make it higher quality, low, lower latency. Um, you can do interesting things like turn it into like a multi, um, uh, multi-format walkie-talkie, so you could talk, you know, like analog, P25, um, GSM, all sorts of different formats. And um, also with the spectrum monitoring, it would be nice to sort of send it up there. And you can also do direction finding from one particular unit. So if you have multiple antennas, depending on how the signal hits the multiple antennas, you can figure out the direction it's coming from. So I, before I went to the States, I used to drive around Sydney with these four makeshift antennas on the roof of my car. Driving around, I had get your amateur radio license, it's a really good way to get into it and, and transmit as an experiment. But I had my amateur radio license in the car just in case the cops pulled me over because I was a bit super sus with all these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you, you can do potentially do that with this. I'm still going to work on that a little bit. Fly it on the drone, you can fly it around and see where the signal might be coming from. Because the problem is, like the light, when you have an urban canyon and buildings, RF signals get reflected on all of the surfaces. And so if you're in that sort of canyon, then it's very ambiguous as to where that signal, the real signal might be coming from. But if you're up high, then that's not really interesting. Hence the drone. I take it that you haven't been visited by ACMA about your transmissions off the <laughs> uh, Actually, some ACMA guys band, came so yesterday and gave a talk up at Terry Hills at the Amateur Air Club, and one of the guys, a couple of the guys apparently from ACMA came. Did they they really enjoyed the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm told, I didn't mention them personally, but a couple of the guys. Did they have any objection to your GSM demo in terms of using frequencies which may otherwise Nothing. be licensed? No comment, but it was all good. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was all good. Well, what wattage do the normal GSM towers run at anyway? Um, Magnitude, approximately. I think, I mean, it depends upon what area the cell is supposed to service, but it's, um, I don't know, tens, hundreds of watts. Yeah, so this is the tiniest fraction. Oh, this is, yeah. Okay, so, for the record, I'm transmitting into a dummy load. <laughs> <laughs> just that it leaks a bit. <laughs> then, that's Oops. just, no, it's a dummy load. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was all the crucial design uh, choices that you had to make to make it as as peak like as as high as six gigahertz? Well, so that one actually 
it's not any design choices we made in particular. That frequency range that excuse me, you actually get uh, is just a result of what this chip can do. So this is actually quite an advanced chip and it's quite um, quite cool because it's it's really putting together all the latest technologies. This is a few years old now, um, but everything is is integrated in this little chip and, and and the way they're designed is that it can actually you know, we're operating on, on any frequency between 70 megahertz and 60 megahertz. It's just how they designed it. And so we picked that one, and, and that's why we get that one. So this is not something we designed ourselves, this is something another company can do. Yeah. The, like, the, I guess, like, for example, the FPGA almost becomes less necessary to use for fast processing. Well, the FPGA is necessary just to provide a, a, a state machine and a link between your host and the front end. So this FPGA does some simple signal processing stuff. So this chip here, the front end, is always running at, at a fixed rate. And um, well, that's not actually entirely true. But you can run at different rates, but this thing will then, for example, if you're receiving, you want to receive at a slower rate that will fit over the link, this will decimate it down. So it'll resample it and then give you a smaller bandwidth. Because you might not want to have the full bandwidth come into your computer. You might only want a smaller bandwidth. Because it's not necessarily have a huge bank if you're only looking at a narrow signal. So this can do that decimation. But it also has a lot of other smarts in there because it needs to control this. It has a state machine um, you know, to put the radio into transmit mode or receive mode or full duplex mode. So that's all realized in here. So this is the thing that controls the radio. And then the state of this is then configured by the driver on the computer. So on the, on the, on the source code on the computer, you just say, create a new circuit instance, set the frequency, set the gain, set the antenna, start giving me samples, and you just call receiver over and over again, like you're dealing with sockets. Same, same deal. But all that's um, abstracting away all the complexity underneath, and it sends you know, all the stuff to configure the, this chip and configure the FPGA for the streaming and all that sort of stuff. We might make this the last question. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you're, you're most welcome if you want to ask me stuff off. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, did you do the parallel of programming yourself? And um, was the design link simulation accurate? Um, so I can't comment too much about the FPGA side of stuff. That's not really my forte. Mm -hmm. um, my colleagues are the, are the gurus that deal with that. They all have great deeds. Um, <laughs> no, they don't. What? <laughs> no, there's some, they're all pretty pretty hip hop and happy groups. <laughs> Alright, cool. Alright, well, can I get everyone to once again thank Belinda? Yeah. Like, oh,